Let's take a look at an interesting little LED driver from AliExpress. What makes this interesting is it's a near unity power factor driver. What that means is that instead of the supply coming on and getting smoothed by a big fat 400 volt smoothing capacitor, it actually chops the sine wave up directly and pulses it through the transformer and it only gets smoothed in the secretary side where it's driving the LED. This one is a 6 to 10 LED at 600 milliamp power supply, so I've got it hooked up to this LED, that should equate to 20 watts. And uh, to get the wire soldered onto this LED, I had to heat this up on a hot plate to get it to about 150 degrees Celsius before I could me melt onto these, because it is an aluminium core uh, PCB. Now there is something, before I show you this, there is something very weird. The first thing I did was, I looked at the chip number, and let me zoom down on this. Here is the schematic of how you're supposed to use this chip in the data sheet. It's got the usual things. It's got the resistor charging up the bootstrap capacitor, and then that gets charged via this uh, diode here to uh, power the unit once it's actually running. It's also got the sense resistor, so it can roughly sense what's happening in the secondary side to detect an overvoltage situation. And then it's got the snubber network. It's the usual things that you'd expect, except this module does not have the feedback winding. Uh, I'm not sure what they've done here. It's not listed. This, this schematic they've used is not what's shown on the data sheet. So let's test this. So I shall get the paperwork out of the way. I shall dazzle you all by pointing this straight up at the camera. I shall get the anti up. The anti-meter. I will plug it in. And we'll see what power it does draw and what the power factor is like, or indeed if it just goes bang. It claims to have a voltage range of 85 volts up to 277 volts, so they're covering every avenue here. This is about to get bright, watch yourself. Well, it's worked, that's good. Uh, 84 milliamps, power factor 0.989, that is almost 0.99 power factor, that's fantastic. 20.38 uh, watts, which is just perfect for what I was expecting here. Okay, that's working. So now, I am going to... Oh, for reference, the anti was just better suited to this. The hoppy is fine, it's down here. It's used for higher loads. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to reverse engineer this, but to do it properly, I'm going to have to take this transformer off. So I shall do that right now, and then we can explore it and see what the circuit diagram actually looks like compared to the data sheet. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore a very interesting bit of circuitry. I shall zoom down this so we can get a closer look at it. The incoming supply comes on here, and there is a bridge rectifier hidden underneath this capacitor that converts the AC to DC, but it doesn't smooth it. There is this capacitor across it, but it's just a sort of interference suppression stability capacitor, 150 nanofarad. It then powers two large planes. You've got a negative plane in the back of the circuit board, and you've got this positive plane here, which is connected to the MOSFET as a sort of heatsink fin, and that's where there's a bit of a slight design issue here, because there is an extra tap on the transformer that isn't really used for anything. It may be a universal design, it may be a universal transformer, but that tap, is, although it's not soldered, it's going through the circuit board here, and it is effectively connected to negative, and it's very close to this uh, positive ground plane. Instead of having a nice wide uh, island round it, they've got virtually nothing here. That is an issue if uh, there's humidity issues it could result in tracking. The best hope there is that the pin doesn't actually touch the side here. Particularly on a 277 volt supply, which this chip is supposedly rated up for, this module, that uh, voltage could approach the best part of 400 volts. Um, here is the little control chip, a very clever little chip indeed. The circuitry is nothing like the datasheet schematic. It's a, they've, I don't know if this is a drop-in alternative chip, because uh, it's quite common to have clone chips. But uh, it's, it's a very different circuit, but it's very clever. So, key components here. We've got a couple of sense resistors, as is common, uh, connected to the MOSFET. We've got a bootstrap resistor here, which trickle charges this capacitor here until the unit can start. It starts off with a quiescent current draw of 50 microamps, but then when it's running, it's about half a milliamp it, it requires. 
The Snubber network, which is based around these components, let's get close to this because we've seen the, the other bit of the circuit board. Let's get in closer. Um, there is a snubber network, but it actually does something clever. It generates the power supply for the chip on each uh, cycle. It's quite neat. Uh, there's a linked out resistor position here. That sets an internal temperature threshold in this chip. It would normally, with a link, be 79.4 degrees Celsius, where it will actually start throttling the current back. I'm not sure exactly what it does, but it's got that. You can set temperature. If that link had not been shorted, it would have had a temperature setting of 135 degrees Celsius, but you can actually change the resistor to actually set anywhere between 79.4 to 135. There's a uh, feedback sense resistor divider here and a really odd little rogue track that comes down here it's a screening track it's uh, there but with no resist over it so it's got a slight layer of solder and it is possibly designed to prevent tracking for or leakage across the circuit board from this component here the mosfet to the sense circuitry but it does kind of compromise on electrical separation I think that's going to be the biggest killer of things like this if moisture gets in. But many of these modules, when used outdoors, would be sealed inside. They'd be potted. Um, the output side of it has the single secondary winding, as usual. It's got a class Y suppression capacitor um, connecting the negative on this side to the negative on the output side. Uh, decent separation. And then a little set of um, spikes, effectively, in the form of triangular pads, as a spark gap, but that is quite a big distance. It's five millimetres, it's almost a quarter of an inch. So that's going to be quite a high voltage before it sparks over that. You wonder how the voltage of the, in the windings would, uh, how the insulation of the windings would uh, deal with that. We've got two capacitors in parallel. We've got a standard high speed diode, not a shot key. And then we've got a 22K resistor here as a little standby load for when uh, things go wrong and the load is not connected to it. Uh, anything else worth mentioning here? I think that's more or less it. I did remove this chip to find where that track went. It turns out it goes nowhere. And also at the same time removed this capacitor, uh, then tried to test the capacitor and it pinged and has gone. So no, no reading off that. I don't know where that capacitor has landed. Here is the schematic. Slight screw up here uh, because I misread a resistor value because I was looking upside down. Uh, 5.9 ohm resistor, I misread that as 5.6 ohm because that's a standard value. It turns out it's not, so that's why that's scored out. So, the circuit's clever. Here's the bridge right far. There's that uh, suppression filter capacitor, stability capacitor. There's a 1 meg ohm resistor that slowly charges this capacitor here. Now, this is a positive rail. I could actually mark that. I could actually show it by just putting a line in that and say, this might make it easier. Positive rail. And this is the improvised negative rail that it creates. So this resistor starts off charging this capacitor up until it reaches its start threshold of about 18 volts. Once it reaches that, it starts pulsing this MOSFET. When it turns the MOSFET on, current flows down and it builds up a magnetic field in the primary here, which is also being used as a feedback coil, until it senses the voltage across the sense resistor that these, uh, the 2 ohm and the 5.9 ohm in parallel, giving 1.4937 ohms. They use two resistors in parallel so they can fine tune it, since it basically sets the power output of the device. Um, it has a current sense detection, and I think the normal one is 0.4 volts, but it also has a facility that if something really went wrong, like the primary shorted or something like that, or uh, the diode shorted out and it was basically just posing a direct shunt, if it sees that rapidly rise up to 1.8 volts, it just shuts the system down and it restarts and goes into that sort of uh, hiccup mode where it starts pulsing. That hiccup mode, when the it does that. The voltage across this capacitor, it switches the chip off. The, it gradually discharges this capacitor. When it reaches about 7.2 volts, that's when it kicks back in again. It, uh, it starts boosting that up to about, well, tries to boost it up to 18 volts. And then uh, that's where it would normally uh, live at in normal operation. Um, if it doesn't start properly, it'll then uh, cut off again.
Um, the primary it has a magnetic field put into it, and then when it detects that uh, 0.4 volts, it will then turn the MOSFET off. The field then collapses and induces the current through this diode here to charge capacitors and drive the LEDs. But it also monitors the voltage across it with this divider here and looks for a couple of voltage thresholds. One is to detect when the LED has been disconnected and the voltage here rises too high. And that will be reflected because this isn't acting as a load. The voltage will stay quite high on this coil uh, winding here. And it results in a high winding. And when it reaches the feedback voltage, what is the feedback voltage? Not really sure. Uh, but when it reaches the threshold, I think it's 3.6 volts. Uh, but when it reaches that threshold, uh, it will actually do that shut off thing if it detects it's gone too high. But it also uses this to detect zero volts across this winding, which also then resets the thing and starts turning the transistor on again. That's how it oscillates at the resonant frequency of the transformer. When the coil turns off, you initially get a slight spike, and that's normally has a snubber network. Here is the snubber network, but it's been used in a very clever way. When it starts collapsing, uh, because this end effect goes positive, it goes through this diode. A portion of it is coupled through this capacitor and onto the power supply capacitor, and that's what acts as a power supply. Uh, this resistor here, 62K, is designed to discharge this uh, capacitor to radiate for the next pulse. And I suppose by changing the value of that, you can determine the speed at which this discharges and fine-tune the amount of energy gets put into this. The manufacturer does recommend 12 to 18 volts on this. Also, if something majorly goes wrong and the voltage is too high going to the power supply, when it reaches 29 volts, the system will also shut down and go into its sort of hiccup mode. Um, and that's more or less it. Interesting if you've not used a shock key here, it's just a standard little diode. And there is the classic 1 nanofarad class Y capacitor. And it looks like they have actually used a, a chunkyish class Y capacitor. The class Y capacitor is a designed to fail in a safe way. If, even if it cracks, it shouldn't move enough to actually short from one side to the other. That's uh, basic because, you know, someone could be handling the output. But in this case, it is just designed for driving LEDs, so that wouldn't be a huge issue. But it's an interesting chip, MT7938. It's well worth investigating. And that's more or less it. It's quite a complex little chip. It's a nicely implemented circuit. It's quite well designed. But it does have that problem of that, uh, the separation on that bizarre extra pin. I wonder what that's for, that tap pin, unless it is just designed for operating at a lower voltage range. But there we have it. Uh, the power factor corrected power supply. It's also worth mentioning that the reason that it is such good power factor is because normally the problem with power factor that's the relationship between voltage and current, is the if they have a big, huge smoothing capacitor on this side and it only gets topped up at the top of the sine wave. In the case of this circuit, it's actually, if this is the rectified uh, sine wave, it's pulsing it across the full length of that, and that averages out as a equivalent current uh, cycle of actually matching that. It's very clever, very neat. Um, but it does have that slight flaw. But then again, most of these tiny little power supplies, they're, they will fail if the moisture gets into them because uh, the separation by necessity of their miniaturization is very low. But there we have it, an interesting and rather geeky little chip, well worth exploring.